Hello, BookTube. I was sitting here on the fainting couch last night, and I was deeply ensconced in fun work. I was also listening to a sudden, dramatic downpour that we had, where it wasn't a gradual ramping up of rain. It was one drop, and then mountains, just rivers of rain for not very long, but very dramatic. When I happened to glance across at the counter uh, that I use to accumulate books that are outgoing, books that are destined for one of you. And I noticed that the counter was pretty full. Uh, so I took the time uh, to go over there and do the part of that that I hate. I really need a postal clerk of my own. I went over there and did the part that I hate, which is making sure the addresses are right, filling out the labels, taping up the packages, that sort of thing. And when I was done with that, I had a whole stack of books. I had a whole tote bag full of books that were going out. So uh, I made an errand out of it this morning, first thing, and went to the post office, which is right around the, the corner from the Brattle Bookshop, which ended me up at the Brattle Bookshop. First thing in the morning, uh, I like to get back here to the Bean as early as I can. So I went first thing in the morning, mailed out a whole bunch of patches. A lot of you have incoming. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, treated myself uh, to some browsing at the Brattle Bookshop. Now, for those of you, there are 200 of you who are new to the channel, the Brattle Bookshop is a used bookstore in downtown Boston. It's really, really good. <laughs> it's a really terrific used bookstore. It's stock turns over all the time, so you can justify completely, if you need to, going all the time, because you're, you're always going to see something new. Uh, and there's a sale lot outdoors that's thousands and thousands more books for one dollar three dollars and five dollars that you can just they're not organized in any other way so you you literally have to look at every single book to know what's out there i was i spent a lot of my time out in the in the sale lot i love it uh i love partly not just the bargain hunting you can fill an arm with books with that and then buy them all <laughs> you, your your total will not be very high if you do that uh but i love not only that part of it but also the the old friends part of it to I'm staring at all of these books and remembering all of these editions, all of these reprints that I haven't seen sometimes in forever, or that I have fond or negative memories associated with. It's just a wonderful time. Uh, and I found a bunch of books, <laughs> so is the, the tagline here. Uh, so I thought I would take you through them. Uh, the first one is in, in not very good shape. I will reinforce it just a bit. I don't imagine that I'm going to read it more than once. Uh, it, but it's something that I had. I got this when it first came out. Or no, not when it first came out. Uh, I got this in uh, 1987, but that was not when it first came out. This is by Barbara Hambly. Some of you will know that author. Uh, and this is a Search the Seven Hills, uh, a historical novel set in ancient Rome that has the, uh, the wraparound cover art like that. Uh, this was originally called, uh, what was it, The Quest of the, the Quirinal Hill Affair, which is one of the Seven Hills of Rome. Uh, it's a weird mouthful, and uh, I'm glad that they changed it. But uh, I remember this uh, the, the thing that originally struck me about this book, the thing that made me even remotely interested to, to read yet another work of Roman historical fiction, uh, was that it is set during the reign of the Emperor Trajan, which is comparatively rare. Uh, he's not in Rome at the time. He's out conquering people. So we get, you know, there are all sorts of uh, jumped-up civilian powers that, our protagonists have to have to deal with and it uh the thing that sort of threw me is that it's a, it's hugely saturated with christianity it's a it's a roman historical novel that is primarily about christianity i don't remember it being uh all that good <laughs> i i never i never saw it when it was the the quirinal hill affair i have no idea what that cover copy even looks like uh i got it when it came out in this as, as this paperback renamed uh, but for a dollar, and I was using store credit, so it was free, uh, I'm perfectly happy to revisit it. Uh, I'm sure that rereading it will spark memories of what I was doing and where I was when I was reading it the first time. So even if the book doesn't improve, the reread will still be a pleasant experience. Uh, then the next three books are for uh, an upcoming event. <laughs> There's yet another booktube event on the horizon. This one is right nearby, and that is June on the Range. Uh, created by Michael K. Vaughn, were designed to celebrate Westerns, the Western genre, Western novels, which once upon a time uh, were inescapable 
and incredibly lucrative for their publishers. Not so much anymore. <laughs> I believe me. I look at the at the book catalogs coming out all the time, and you'll you'll be hard pressed to find a normal, a standard formulaic Western. They they just they barely exist at all. Uh, but they have existed in their profusion, and June is going to be a time for me to, I hope a lot of you, to revisit them. Just read a ton of romances. Uh, not romances, westerns. Uh, so I got a bunch of them, uh, mainly staying away from the beaten path. Mainly sticking to rom uh, romance, I keep saying romance, western authors uh, that I'm not all that familiar with. Like, for instance, John Benteen. Uh, this is one of his Fargo novels. Not the, the town, but rather the, the ruthless killer. Fargo, this is Massacre River. And there is our hero loading a rifle with TNT. <laughs> don't, don't see how that's going to work to do anything other than blow you into little rag muffins, but I guess Fargo knows best. We know that because the cover tells us. Get in Fargo's way and he'll kill you between drinks. Only a liar would call him a nice guy. He's the best man killer in the business. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right, fine. Uh, and this came out in uh, 1969. Uh, so it, it fills one of the, the very vague reading prompts for, for June on the Range, which is to read something in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, that isn't Louis L'Amour or Zane Grey. <laughs> it isn't a reprint of the two titans that, that dominate the industry. I've never read... Uh, a Fargo novel. I don't think I've ever read John Benteen at all, so. Uh, then uh, this next one is uh, Gordon Sheriffs, and this is The Manhunter, a towering novel of the West. Uh, just another uh, Western uh, pot boiler here. Lee Kershaw knew when he crossed the border into Mexico that every rally in the territory was on the lookout for him. But the offer of $5,000 in gold to find five small pieces of leather was too good to turn down. What Lee couldn't know was that those pieces of leather would turn the hunter into the hunted, and that any man who held a piece of the map was as good as dead. <laughs> now, I have no idea uh, if these things are any good at all. All I know is that I don't know them. I, you want to get down, baby? You want to come down and cuddle next to me? Oh, you do. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you see that? She's stretching. Oh, <laughs> Then she'll, then she'll come to light right next to me. Uh, and then the third Western that I found is uh, a, a Walt Slade novel. This is by Bradford Scott, and it is Bullets for a Ranger, uh, which doesn't, doesn't seem like an even match on the, on the front cover there, but I kind of like the cover artwork. A lot of this period cover artwork for Westerns is, is terrific. Uh, what have we got here? Uh... Fearsome figures in gleaming armor, spirits of conquistadores striking terror into the herdsmen of Texas's Matagorda Bay. But maybe Slade told himself they're not ghosts, just smart owl hoots wrapped in tin plate. So the ranger ace went ghost hunting with hot lead and fighting fury. <laughs> it's ten to one. Ten to, I, don't, I haven't read this, of course. This is from, I think, the 1970s. Uh... 1963. Uh, I haven't read this, but I can. The, the, the one of the comforting things about westerns is that you don't really need. They're not reinventing the wheel. I'd be willing to bet that okay, it's an it's a clever owl hoot gang dressing as the ghosts of long dead conquistadors in order to frighten people and com commit robberies under the guise of the supernatural. And I'd be willing to bet that in the climactic scene, there really are the ghosts of conquistadors that help the good guy. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I'll report back. So I got those three uh, westerns for June on the Range. Well, three of out of many, many westerns that I will be reading for June on the Range. But uh, as some of you may have seen, there's another event coming <laughs> in August here on BookTube, and that is Garb August. That is reading trash in the month of August. So I've been keeping an eye out <laughs> for trash of all kinds, uh, and I found two pieces of trash, but some purists, certainly purists from an earlier generation, would violently argue. They would say, I only found one piece of trash. We'll start with the piece of trash that no one is going to argue with. The piece of, the piece of trash that certainly is trash. Uh, this is Danger Planet uh, by Brett Sterling. 
Brett Sterling being, of course, a pseudonym. <laughs> I think most of the things that I've been talking about so far have been pseudonyms of one kind or another. But the, the, the tortured history of Captain Future, that super hottie there with the gun is presumably Captain Future, but the tortured history of Captain Future, is, I don't know how many pulp experts have actually pieced it out and done all of the research. It was a magazine. The, the character had many adventures. No attempt was made to make the adventures internally or externally consistent. The character had many writers. Some of the writers wrote uh, under their own names. Some wrote under pseudonyms. Some of the pseudonyms were house pseudonyms. I think Bruce Sterling was a house pseudonym for whoever's writing the Captain Future story this month, and maybe there aren't any written records of who that was. And the exact timing and publication and whatnot i if there is such a an, an in the weeds pulp history of this character and this concept and this publication because the publication was also called captain future i would love to read it i think that would be so fascinating it involves uh writers that i know about from other realms of uh of well, i want to say creative endeavor but writing anyway to hack work on a typewriter mort weisinger for instance uh, a staple of the comic book world of my generation, was involved up to his eyeballs with Captain Future, who is, uh, he's, well, <laughs> I wonder if this tells us what it is. <laughs> One million years back in the swirling, shrouded past, evil ultra-beings ruled the planet Rue. Suddenly, unbelievably, they are alive again, threatening the universe with total destruction. Only one man dares challenge the evil ones. He is Captain Future, intergalactic agent of justice, whose identity is top secret, whose strength is ultimate. He sets out alone to stop the deathless menace creeping ever closer. And this is the, the book that introduces Captain Future. I could swear that I've read a couple of Captain Future uh, adventures, whether in magazines or, re or anthologies or whatnot, but I could, that, I don't know what that, that cover means, his strength is ultimate. I don't recall this character having superpowers of any kind. I think, he, if I remember correctly, he had, like, a robot who was super powerful. But I don't think he was. Uh, but <laughs> come August, I will be happy to re-explore. Uh, and then there's the book. I admit I bought it for the cover art. But also, I, I haven't reread this in 80 million years. And it's the one where some purists may say it's not trash. I'm not sure, if true, how much of that is the veneer that time gives to pretty much anything, except Varney the Vampire. <laughs> this is E.W. Horner, and this is Raffles, the first of his, I think this is a Raffles collection. Uh, or maybe this is the a Raffles novel. There was a Raffles novel that wasn't. No, this is, this is a collection, I believe, of stories about the, uh, the gentleman thief, Raffles, and his manservant, uh, his assistant. Uh, and I, I confess, I, I was drawn to it for the J.C. Leyendecker cover there, which I'm cover design is by Michael Farrell. I wonder if Leyendecker will even be credited. For a long time there, his work would show up on covers and simply not be credited, as if anyone could draw that. Uh, yeah, no, he's not credited at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was... Yeah, Horning was uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's brother-in-law, and... and very much wrote Raffles with Sherlock Holmes in mind. As a, Raffles is a kind of counterpart, a thief instead of an, uploader, an upholder of the law, but equally charismatic. Uh, and, you know, with with a Watson, basically. And uh, this is from... Uh, when, was, when did this originally come out? I just had the cover on you. This was uh, first published in 1899. And, sorry, the camera is bouncing around. Someone is trying to dig her way down into the core of the earth. What are you doing? What are you doing? Well, you might as well see right? what she's doing. She's just, what are you doing, baby? What? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that I think Raffles is trash. Uh, and it, I think the only thing that would cause people not to think that would maybe be uh, affectionate memories of, I don't know, who, was who played this guy in the movies? Is it David Niven? Uh, maybe affectionate, movies of, of, uh, affectionate memories of a movie or time. 
that maybe time's passage has dulled the, the sense that this isn't very good. Or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I got it. I will get to it in August. <laughs> uh, then we have a couple of really thick trade paperbacks. Uh, the first one is from when I was working in uh, a bookstore. That's when we got it. 2001. Uh, and it's by Lawrence James, and it's called Warrior Race. It's a big, fat history. This is a trade paperback. I had the hardcover forever and ever, uh, and complained about the hardcover at the bookstore forever and ever. This is a history, a military history of, of Britain. Uh, on land, on sea, the big figures, the forgotten figures, the martial kings and queens. And I uh, had a set routine, a set outrage routine at my information desk because the hardcover has Nelson on the cover. <laughs> the hardcover is Admiral Nelson on the cover. Instead of, if you're going to do that, if you're going to celebrate that time period instead of any other, surely Wellington should be on the cover, right? The guy who actually beat Napoleon instead of the guy who died trying. Uh, but this doesn't have that problem. This has Doughboys and Trafalgar. Uh, and I haven't read this. This came out in 2001. I read it then. Customers would come in and say, hey, you know, I'm seeing this big book on the front tables. It's right up my alley. Is it any good? So I read it, uh, and I haven't read it since then. And that's 20 years. So uh, happy to find it uh, in a trade paperback instead of, you know, a big, heavy hardcover that will take up more space on the shelf. Uh, and then... Uh, the next trade paperback, this was part of a loose trilogy of books, and I, I don't think I've ever seen this trade paperback. I, I'm assuming that this thing must be foreign. Yeah, it's, it's Grove Atlantic UK. That's probably why I never saw it. The, the American cover was very boring. It was in, in kind of an ironic red, white, and blue. Uh, and it sold like the Dickens. <laughs> oh, my, I couldn't keep it in the shop. Uh, this is by uh, Michael Gordon and General Bernard Trainer, and it is Cobra II, the, the inside story of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. There you have the malefactors up top there, and there are the grunts that are going to get blown to pieces, and this is the size of the book. And there, these two collaborated on two other books. This was the one that really did it. This was the one that popped, the one that really sold. This came out in... Uh, when did this come out? Uh... This paperback came out in 2007. The book was first published in 2006. And the, the two authors consulted an enormous number of, re, of uh, sources, including lots and lots of classified material. It was pointed out by many people at the time that under the Patriot Acts, the so-called Patriot Acts, crammed through Congress by President Bush, literally in the middle of the night, according to those Patriot Acts, when this book came out in 2006, both of its authors could have been arrested without pretense, without warrant, without trial, held without incommunicado, without lawyer, forever. Or until maybe the Patriot Acts were allowed to sunset out of existence. This kind of thing, any kind of criticism of the United States, any kind of portrayal of the United States as hapless, incompetent, or evil, fell under the Patriot Acts. I was outraged when those things happened. Outraged. It, it, the, the speed and the clandestine nature by, way, by the way that it happened led me and a whole bunch of other people to think this was in the way, this was in the wings, this was planned. This, the, this legislation was sitting around waiting for a reason. Uh, but I, I borrowed a copy of Cobra II from the bookstore. When I saw so many customers were reading it, I borrowed it and read it. I thought it was really good. Very, very... Uh, the, the, I, th I was struck by the fact that although it, it was then you know, hot-button stuff. Did did we invade Iraq illegally? Is is it a quagmire? That sort of thing. I was also struck by the the authors always remembering to tell a good story, to fill the book with personalities and tensions instead of just, you know, collating research information. So, again, this has been a long time, almost 20 years. So I, will, I was very happy to find it. I'll give it another try. And maybe whoever got rid of this at the Brattle has the, got rid of the other two. I think it's unlikely. This was a better seller than the other two, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the names of the other two books uh, that these two wrote together. Uh, but this sold better than the other two, and uh, probably that means, since this is a UK paperback, probably somebody grabbed this in an airport bookstore, headed to Boston 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever, uh, because it was so popular. It didn't bother to bring all three. I doubt very much that somebody brought all three, so I'll, I'll take what I can get, absolutely. 
Uh, then this next one, perfect example of my saying that I always, those of you who are new, I always say about the brattle, that the brattle will provide. And what I mean by that is that the, the turnover is so great at the brattle, that, and their buying truck is out all the time. Collections large and small, all kinds of interests, not just antiquarian stuff that only two people in the state have, uh, that, that sooner or later you see everything at the brattle. Sooner or later you do. So my, my standard refrain is the brattle will provide. If I'm reading something and I flip to the bibliography or the notes and I see something referenced that I've never heard of but I want now to read, or that I have heard of and once had and now kicking myself that I don't have, that I got rid of it, instead of going online and putting myself at the mercy of the blatant black and white liars selling used books online for extortionate prices, I just say the brattle will provide. Sooner or later, I will see it. At the prattle, no books are urgent. No books are immediate. This is not brain surgery. That's one of the fun things about reading. Uh, that's also, the brattle will provide is also the philosophy behind uh, the aforementioned mailing shelf. <laughs> uh, because when somebody contacts me and said, I heard you talking about this book, I remember it very fondly, or uh, my dad was watching your video and he had that book once upon a time and really wants a copy. But I live in a book desert. There are no bookstores anywhere around. The one that's 100 miles away is terrible. I also don't want to fall prey to online booksellers who lie about their wares. Uh, where was I? You really get your bang for the buck if you slow down to a mile an hour. That way everybody gets to hear a siren. Uh, of course, you weren't using it for any reason other than that the taco place you really like is about to close. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, right. Uh, when, I, when I'm talking about these videos, people get in touch with me and say, I don't have any way to get that book. I don't want to shop online. I've been burned too many times, and there's nowhere for me to shop in person. And usually when that happens, I just think, well, you know, if it's, well, let's look at the shelves here. If it's a copy of uh, My Life and Loves by Frank Harris or Marshall's book on World War I or uh, even Christianity by Dermot McCullough, if it's a copy of something like that, I'm going to see that at the Brattle. And I, I have the luxury of having access to that, so I'll just take the copy that I have and send it to the people who don't have access to that. Uh, and this next book is a perfect demonstration of the Brattle will provide because I mentioned I found the sequel, the prequel, just the other day, and showed it to you on a Brattle Hall. And at the time, I thought, well, if the prequel's here, then maybe the se maybe the original book will eventually turn up at the Brattle. I was willing to wait, but I didn't have to wait more than a few days. This is by C. C. Humphreys, and it is Jack Absolute in a very nice trade paperback, much better than the hard than the little mass market that I got. If I could, if I could have had my choice, this would have been the form that I would have picked it in. Uh, and li here, let me read you this because this is—I remember this being tre tremendously fun. Uh, the year is 1777. As the war for American independence rages across the sea, London is swept off its feet by Jack Absolute, the dashing rogue in Richard Sheridan's comedy *The Rivals*. That is, until the real Jack Absolute, former captain of the 16th Light Dragoons, returns after years abroad to discover this slander of his reputation. Before he can even protest, he's embroiled in a duel over an alluring actress of questionable repute, and his only escape is the one he dreads most, to be pressed again into the king's service, this time as a spy for the British in the Revolutionary War. So a real twist on the normal lines of hero and villain in this period of historical fiction. Very happy to find this. That's wonderful. I've held off the, the sequel... I call it, it's set earlier in Jack Absolute's life, and it's called The Blooding of Jack Absolute. And I've held off on reading it because I was kind of hoping that someday soon I would find the, the original book. Never expected it to happen this fast. Uh, very happy about that fact. Uh, and then the last book here is a pure indulgence on my part. Uh, rare thing, I usually just hoover up books and I get rid of them. I get rid of them almost as fast as I get them. Uh, but I love this book. I have the ebook. But I love, I love the, the physical book. The physical book and I have a history together. I got a copy 
uh, when it was new from a relative. I got a copy uh, at the same time from the History Book Club, slightly different form factor. I got rid of both of those. Those are both long gone, have had other copies over the years. Always go back to it, always end up finding it enjoyable. Very, very enjoyable. And I, years ago, seven, six or seven years ago, I got a hardcover at the Brattle uh, with a ragged dust jacket. The, none of these things are in bad shape. None of the books I got today are in bad shape. But sometimes you do. Sometimes you find a book at the Brattle that's the dust jacket's seen better days. And I use, to the horror of you book preservation purists out there, I use packing tape, just ordinary plastic packing tape to reinforce those dust jackets. The books aren't worth anything. The restoration is not meant to be any, in any way archival. It's merely meant to make the book durable enough for me to read one time, two times, until it goes out of my collection and into the garbage. Uh, and when I got this book, a copy of this book, I did that with the dust jacket. I reinforced the dust jacket and I reread it at the time. Uh, but today I was looking in the outside carts and I found a copy of this book in brand new condition with a plastic library dust jacket over it. It's simply a better edition than, than the ramshackle repair work that I did. It's this. It's well known to all of you. It's A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuckman, uh, which is, I just love it. I think it's just a, a perfect example of narrative history for a general populate, for a general readership. But look at this thing. I mean, it's as new as the day it came out. It, it, and it's got one of these plastic covers on it. So, I mean, since it, it wasn't costing anything, these things weren't ra ra racking up a bill. I had store credit. I just decided to get it. Uh, and now I have two copies. I have more than that. I have the uh, a trade paperback of this. I have an ebook of this, at least one. Uh, and I now I have two hardcovers. I have a hardcover that has a Steve repair job on it. It's not an ugly thing. But it's not like this. <laughs> so so I guess if one of you wants the Steve Repair hardcover, feel free to email me. A distant Mirror is not hard to come by, but I'll, some of you tell me stories about stories that some of the rest of us should keep in mind. We should keep in mind how lucky we are to be able to go to either a variety of charity shops and used bookstores that have a constantly overturning stock or a gem like the Brattle Bookshop. There aren't many like it, and I... I like to think that I'm always grateful for that. Uh, but I do have I do have a hardcover double of this thing. I'm going to transfer notes into this thing from uh, my trade paperback, I think. Although I took I when I I got an ebook copy of this a couple of years ago and and annotated that as well. I'll collate all sorts of notes in this. Thing. It'll be a lot of fun. I'll probably end up rereading it. Uh, but anyway, that was my Brattle trip this morning. That was a fraction of my Brattle trip. I, in addition to mailing out all sorts of things at the post office and then walking around the corner to the Brattle to shop for myself, I also walked around the corner to the Brattle to shop for other people <laughs> and, and used uh, the good offices of the Brattle bookshop to mail books out from there. So some of you are getting books from me and others will be getting books from the Brattle. <laughs> Care of me. But that was, it was a fun little digression. It's totally different weather. That blast of rain that came down in buckets last night for 15 minutes at the most was a harbinger of a change in front. The, the soppy humidity, the, the heat that, that just reached its peak yesterday, totally gone this morning. Uh, and we're going to go through this again. This pattern is going to happen again. I believe this is going to be the pattern of the whole summer, where the heat peaks at some unreasonable, sometimes unprecedented point, and then drops off dra drastically, and then peaks again, and then drops off drastically again. So this the the idea that of old summers where it just got hot and stayed hot. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. It's certainly not going to happen in May and June. Uh, we've got another one of those patterns coming right now. So it's it's dry and beautiful now, but by the weekend, we're going to hit ninety degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, but anyway. That's a Brattle book haul for you today. A little bit of everything here. We have a distant mirror in this perfect condition copy. Couldn't leave it behind. We have Jack Absolute. Not, not more than a week after I said that I wanted to find it. Uh, we have a trade paperback of Cobra II about the invasion of Iraq. Going to make grim and infuriating rereading. We have Warrior Race uh, by Lawrence James, who I just love as a historian. Uh, then we have Raffles in this Penguin mass market. Uh... We have Danger Planet, the very first Captain Future adventure. Uh, we have Bullets for a Ranger, The Manhunter, and Fargo, Massacre River. Three books for June on the Range, a read-along 
coming soon to a dry gulch near you. <laughs> and finally, uh, the search for the seven, the search, search the seven hills, Barbara Hamley's uh, ancient Roman uh, early Christianity novel. Uh, so there you go. Not not a bad little Brattle Hall. I, I confess, uh, the highlight for me was not anything that I got for myself. I mean, I was happy to, to find this distant mirror, and I love the fact that I could find Jack Absolute, that I don't need it anymore. I'm not looking for it forever and ever. I don't even have to contemplate getting it online. Uh, for me, the highlight was always uh, sending out goodies to the rest of you. That is just so much fun. <laughs> it's just so, so much fun. And right now, that counter is empty. <laughs> That's not going to stay true, but right now it's empty. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now. That was a brattle haul for this Tuesday, uh, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.